I really like the idea that as a soul, before we incarnate into this existence, that we do specify intentions of what we are given the choice to learn in this life. This is synchronicity. 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 Welcome to episode 94 of Synchronicity, and you may have guessed from the waves and the Enya that I'm on vacation at the beach, and it's fucking great. Once a year, at least, I try to get down here to the beach. Um, it's been a really stressful year. If, you may, if you're a regular listener of Synchronicity, you probably have pieced together that this past year has been let's just say a little fucking crazy for me. So getting down here um, and being able to decompress and de-stress is just, it's really great. If you don't have an opportunity to do that or you haven't done it in a while, you know, if you can get to a body of water, that's like, that's my personal favorite place to be. But anywhere you can go where you can de-stress and just kind of feel better, decompress a little bit, highly recommended it. Huge thing to do as a human being. If you don't do it, you tend to get burned out and that doesn't help anyone. So I'm feeling pretty good. Today's guest, Thomas Miller, also feeling pretty good. He lives in Aspen, Colorado, living the life of his dreams pretty much right now, running a podcast called Subconscious Mind Mastery. Really cool dude. You'll hear us talk about a ton of stuff. We kick off with some astrology, then some still small voice within, subconscious aspects, you know, penetrating into different layers of reality reincarnation. It's, it's pretty fucking cool. Thomas is a really cool dude, and his podcast is also very awesome. Um, let's talk about a few different things this week. So as I was getting down here to North Carolina, uh, I was reading an article the other day that basically was talking about how climate change is like the worst possible thing in the world. Pretty much we're all fucked in every possible way, way worse than we possibly thought we could be. And, you know, it was a really well-written article. The person had an incredibly, you know, cogent sense of what was going on, well-researched, but there was literally no solution. So I kept saying to Alexis as I was reading, I was like, this guy's like kind of a dick. Like he's like, seems like the guy at like a meeting where he's just like pointing out every single problem and has absolutely no solution. But more importantly, it got me thinking like, what what is going on with the person who wrote this article and really collectively when we start thinking about these doomsday scenarios related to climate change and don't get me wrong like i'm not a denier of climate change like it, it's happening and this everything that this guy was writing about could be totally on point we could be screwed million ways right now but that wasn't the point it seems like kind of a collective and individual fear of annihilation Right. When we think about either the planet, like and when we talk about, you know, like a mass level extinction, the planet will will be fine. This is George Carlin's famous thing. The planet's gonna be fine. The human species may be totally wiped out, just like a lot of other species before us, but the planet's gonna be fine. So don't grieve for the planet. Um, us, on the other hand, our species maybe won't survive. So I'm not in any way dismissing that. But what I think it really points to is a general fear of death. And I think when we start talking about doomsday scenarios, a lot of us gets freaked out, especially if we have kids, like have a kid, 
you know, if he has kids, eventually this leads to a scenario where like shit is totally fucked. Right. But that's not what we're supposed to be focusing on in my estimation. Really what it's about is trying to improve our lives, trying to work on the issues that hinder and hamper us and create more suffering for ourselves and those around us. And if we can take our limited time on this planet, um, you know, to to work on those things, that's really what it's about. Of course, if we can scale up to the global issues facing humanity so we can continue on as a species, I think that would be fantastic. But I also maintain this viewpoint that this this world we live in, and this, again, doesn't dismiss the importance of working on practical things, but this world we live in is much more like a dream than we like to imagine it is which gives us, of course, real consequences, but also the ability to kind of shape it into the way that works for us, if that makes sense. So anyway, it was about basically how this whole Doomsday article um, really just got me thinking about life and death and everything in between and after. Uh, Speaking of which, next week, I rarely do this, but I'm going to tease the episode. Uh, Tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Evan Alexander, who wrote the book Proof of Heaven, um, you know, famously a neurosurgeon, got E. coli, bacterial meningitis, was in a coma for seven weeks, experienced incredible things, came back full recovery, maintaining the knowledge and the experiences, and really changed changed a lot of people's minds about what was going on. So that's going to be next week's episode. I'm really looking forward to that one. So between listening to his audiobook, Proof of Heaven, getting ready for that, the Doomsday article, and then just being near the water. <laughs> and my birthday is uh, on Thursday. I'm really everything is is clicking, feeling pretty good. So I hope everything is good with you too. Uh, thank you. A quick thank you to everyone who's donated on Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Synchronicity. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my friend Patrick Nemchik, who is a wonderful producer level credit for Synchronicity, which means every episode I mention his name because he's fucking great. If you want to check out the rewards, go there, patreon.com slash synchronicity. If you want to hear the, you know, you hear music on this episode besides Enya, uh, I make it, you can get access as an MP3 or streamable. Go check it out. Uh, Rate, review, blah, 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 blah. Let's get to the episode. How about that? Without further ado, here is Thomas Miller. Just the past week, especially, I don't know if it's a full moon thing or what, but it has just been total chaos. Like just have you did you have you read about the full moon? I read about it briefly. Also, just uh, let me thank you for doing this because we're just going to jump into it right now. We'll just okay. assume this right, is recording. Go. So thanks. Thanks for doing this, man. Um, oh, absolutely. Great to be with you. But I would tell me about the full moon because I've just been noticing this recently. Um, someone told me something about the full moon, this one in particular, which I think we're ending soon, hopefully, um, being particularly chaotic. And I, I am someone who is aware of the lunar cycles, not totally tuned in, um, aware of the astrological impact on the celestial bodies in our life, but I don't, um, I'm not like totally tuned in. I'm like kind of just aware of it. Um, but I got to say this past week, this whole full moon thing, whatever is going on, it was just been un, un stopping, unceasing chaos. <laughs> like everything that could seemingly go wrong has been going wrong. Uh, what What are your observations? <laughs> My goodness. I'm sorry about that, Noah. <laughs> it's all right. I'm going on vacation. <laughs> There's, Yay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, the, so the, the day that we're recording this, I, I'll, I'll give you some good news. The moon is in Pisces, which is calming. It's water. You're headed to water. It's all good, my friend. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) The turn, we've we've come out of the change. I had a podcast listener ask me if I would do a podcast on manifesting with the moon. Yeah. It opened up so much amazing stuff, and I've really become excited about it. So I was like you, just distantly, yeah, yeah, the moon's in Aries, the moon's in Aquarius, <laughs> the moon's in Scorpio, whatever, you know? Right. So uh, let me see here. Hang on. Just Oh, I, I, I remember what it is. It's called Deluxe Moon. I don't have my phone here in yeah, front of me, yeah, but no it's problem. called Deluxe Moon. You can get the app. It might be a couple of bucks. That would be the most that it is. And the cool part about it, it's a very deep app, so it gives you 
the moon rise time, the moon set time in your own time zone. It syncs to the clock on your phone. And the other thing that's really great is it tells you what astrological sign the moon is. Right. And it has a calendar. So you can look between a new moon and a full moon and see which astrological sign the moon is going through. So the moon moves really fast yes. uh, through, through, the, through, uh, through the zodiac signs. So it only stays two or three days, mostly two days. And then, of course, to get the offset of the 28 days, it stays for three a couple of times. Right. So you're only experiencing a given lunar energy for a brief period of time. So if it is chaotic, hopefully it will only be chaotic for 48 hours or so. Yeah, yeah. Now, what, <laughs> what I came across on this full moon was that there were some solar winds that were reaching the Earth. And on the night of the full moon, there was a sunspot that doubled in size. Hmm. And you know that can have impact on everything, including yes. technology. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. And this uh, past full moon, oh, let's see. I'm going to have to look. Hang on. No problem. Let me look at my notes. I'm fascinated by this, too, because uh, it just seems like there's been enough times where I'll independently think of something like I'll be like, wow, like, why am I staying? Like, I have, I have a young son now, so I'm typically going to sleep much sooner than I have been in the past. So, you know, like 10 o'clock, 10, 30, 11, where normally I was staying up till two, three. So when I do stay up that late, I'm like, oh, that's weird. What's going on? And sure enough, almost every single time I find myself kind of not being able to go to sleep around that, it's a full moon. So I know there's clear, clear impact. My, uh, my sun sign is, is the moon. I'm a cancer. And I know there's a tremendous impact of what's going on there. And it just pops up in my life so much. But yeah, I'm, I'm, tell me about your notes. All right. So this full moon was in Capricorn. Yes. And it followed the new moon on June 23rd, which was in Gemini. Mm. Now, here's, here's kind of what's, what's crazy. Let's start with the new moon. Okay. So if you start your cycle with the new moon, that's the time that you want to make a list of things that you want to bring into your life. Right. That's your creation list. Now, most people would say create on the new moon, release on the full moon. But really what you can do is you can stretch that through the entire cycle. So you have 14 days as the moon is waxing or getting right. bigger that you are expanding your creation list. So I went, I live in Aspen and yeah. I went up to the top of Independence Pass, which is east of here, beautiful location up on the Continental Divide at 12,000 feet. And on the new moon night of June 23rd, I did this little ceremony hmm. where I took my releasing list from the prior full moon. I printed it on a little piece of paper. It's been really dry up here in Colorado. So I was really careful about this, <laughs> even though there's not much grass on the top of the mountain. It's uh it's pretty rocky up there. And I, uh, I took a fire starter and I did a little meditation and just looked at the beauty that was around me, expressed a lot of gratitude. And then right at sunset, I lit the um, releasing list on fire. And it was like that was the completion. Mm. Just as the sun was going down over the mountain. And then, of course, 30, 45 minutes later, it got dark and the Milky Way was just big and bright. Saw satellites streaking wow. across the sky. It was just really amazing up there. And during that time, as dark set, I do this on my phone. So I keep it in my notes program on my phone so I can just refer back to it every day. I created my creation list. So here on the night of the new moon, I, I finalized or culminated the releasing list by burning it ceremoniously, just burning it. Right. I piled up a few rocks and just set it on fire in there and then made sure that no embers were getting out and then created my list of what I wanted to manifest. Yeah. What well, were, July. Yeah. yeah no, no, no. Can go, go, go. Keep, keep going. So July, July 9th then was the full moon in Capricorn. So on the full moon, what I did is, uh, went down to the John Denver Park. There's a memorial garden here for the singer John Denver. And it's just a beautiful park. There's a little offshoot of the Roaring Fork River that goes through there and several places to meditate. Hmm. 
And as the moon started to come up through the trees, it was just a beautiful, Hmm. I get emotional thinking about it because it's just such a beautiful setting and that I have the privilege to live here just still since I was a kid, I wanted to live in Colorado and here it is manifested. And I mean, this is it, this is what it looks like, right? So you make, you make the most of every minute of it. And now I didn't burn my creation list. (laughs) 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 No, (laughs) I just completed it. (laughs) Right. Right. I didn't burn it. I think there's a big, um, subconscious boost to burning your releasing list. Mm. But then I'll probably roll quite a few things in my creation list because I put some really big stuff. I mean, I'm playing big. This wasn't, yeah. this wasn't little stuff. This was big stuff. And there was movement, significant movement in my creation list. That was what was really cool. Now I had another podcast listeners. I was doing this, um, this podcast really kind of a series on manifesting with the moon. I uh, got this note from a guy in Germany and he said that four days on either side of the full moon, he's been journaling for years Mm. that good things start to happen to him. Mm. And he gave some examples. I had a, I did a coaching call with him a couple of weeks ago and he was stuck on this business idea And just to frame this up, this guy uh, doesn't work because he sold a business. Right. So this is no schlock businessman that just happens to be stuck and not knowing what to do. He literally had hit a wall. We did the coaching thing, and within a few days, he got movement in it and actually found an investor in Italy that wanted to uh, buy into this business that he's trying to do right now. That's awesome. All right. He, He gave me another story. He wanted to trade a high end, actually it was a Porsche, uh, for his wife. He wanted to trade in a Porsche that he had and then get his wife a Volvo. <laughs> and I guess both, you know, pretty expensive cars. So this was a, he was dealing with the dealership and a bank and they came back and they said, no way, Jose, it's not going to work. And, uh, the bank will never accept this. Right. And he said, okay, no problem. Within the four day window of the full moon, his phone rings. It's the car dealer. He says, there is no reason that this ever happened. We've never heard of this before, but the bank has accepted your offer. Oh, wow. Made the deal. Another one. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do you think these are examples? Because I want to get into your history and and subconscious mind mastery and just kind of how you got into all this stuff. I know we just launched into our astrological discussion, but do you think that's an example of kind of getting in touch with the more intuitive subconscious aspects of our consciousness? Um, Or is there a Zodiac influence or is it a mix of both? What's your personal interpretation with these things? Cause I, I, I don't, I'm asking that as I don't know where I stand on all of that stuff. So I'd love to hear, hear your stuff. And then after that, I just want to find out more about you, man. Like we've only had a couple of conversations, but it's obviously very easy for us to, to flow back and forth. So I'm, I'm, Really interested in, in hearing your story too, but yeah. So what what do you think though about is this the zodiac? Is this other celestial body influences, or is this us tapping into kind of deeper layers of ourselves and kind of opening up to what is? What what's your take on that? That is an awesome question, and I'm going to take your answer C. Okay, because I think it's a combination of the two, and right. here's here's how I view zodiac, and and the astrologers out there might cringe at my answer a little bit, but just <laughs> go with me here. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. And it's because I'm not an experienced ex- astrologer. I'm very much a self-proclaimed garage hack at <laughs> astrology. Right. I have to go look stuff up. You know, it's like, but I I I know how to navigate it, but but I think what astrology does. I'm not so much on the predictive side of astrology right, as much right. as I am on the personality side. Right. And to me, what astrology does brilliantly is it shows us where energy concentration or hotspots are. Mm. And that's not only for you and me, but it's for everybody around us. Right. So yes, I think your A answer is correct that there are energies floating around during these significant times, especially the moon having a very significant, I mean, 
ask any veterinarian, right. ask any farmer, ask anybody who works in an emergency room if there's significance to the full moon right, or police right. or police officer. You know, right, it's like right. absolutely there is. So we know that there's a different energy around us. At the same time, once we do get intuitively plugged in, we are creators, and you know that very well. Right. So we set our own destiny by our intentions. Right. And and yes, through in this is the thing that I'm focusing on my podcast right yeah, now. Yeah. Just living by intuition, living from yes. inside. Allowing that still small voice to be serve be uh, prominent, and the conscious mind, the monkey mind, the ego self, to be subservient <laughs> in leading right. and guiding our lives. Right. And when you do that, you're living on a divine plane. I mean, that's I think as close to highest consciousness as we can be yeah. on Earth. So, in that, we're always guided. Right. So there's energy going on around us, yet we're guided. Where the two of those meet, I think, are the reflections of what astrology can teach us. Mm, mm. And then we're aware of these energy concentrations, and then we can use them to our advantage. Yeah, I, I love the way you put that, too. And this idea of, um, you know, kind of our more intuitive, higher self being the energy that runs the show rather than the ego um, is really important. Now, this is something I've been thinking about in a lot of different modalities is how difficult it can be to remain kind of in that uh, surrendering, selfless service, intuitive kind of knowingness um, when you have to be a person in the world, right? And you need your, you know, I hear this a lot, like a lot of people want to just obliterate the ego and i and no, i and i yeah. get the the benefits i've done enough psychedelics to know what the the benefits and pitfalls of that can be um the problem is is we still use our ego to navigate the world anyone who has this uh, this has happened to me I, there was a period in my life where i was very very open and very very trusting to the point of being naive because i you know i tapped into the fundamental nature of the universe it's unconditional love so that's how i'll act the problem is, is not everyone around you is necessarily acting like that. Uh, it's all <laughs> <laughs> so you can really get into some tricky situations. So trying to find that balancing line uh, or that balance between or the harmony between, um, you know, letting go, surrendering, knowing what's right, really being in tune with that, trusting your intuition and then still navigating, making sure that, you know, you can pay the rent, that you can take care of your responsibilities, all of these things. Um, I think is this very interesting point we find ourselves right now in this point in history, because I feel like we're shifting slowly from this very practical uh, left brained type of paradigm for culture, at least Western culture. And we're starting to see this seeping in of these more intuitive faculties like the the art and science of astrology, like the fact that you and I can have this conversation right off the bat about astrology and not just get sucked into either some new age pop astrology or some totally dismissive, no, that's bullshit thing speaks to, I think, this thing that's happening in the world. So I love that you you kind of highlighted that that whole ego and, you know, intuition type thing. Let me ask you this, Thomas, give me kind of a, a brief uh, kind of nutshell. It doesn't even have to be a nutshell. As long or as brief as you want. How did you start getting into this stuff? Has it been a lifelong thing? You have had, you know, different experiences in life. I know from our discussions, you've you've been in different jobs, you've had different experiences. But like, what was the path that kind of took to, took you to where you are now? Well, I hit a bottom in my life at age forty seven that woke me up, and that was the turning point. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was a wonderful little flyover town, but it was a very fundamental town. Mm. And I grew up in an aspect of fundamental Christianity mm. and it was my whole life. It was my, uh, our home was totally based around the Bible. I went to Christian schools growing up, was not allowed to go to a secular college because it would turn me into a communist. I mean, that's <laughs> seriously what I grew up with. Yeah. And so I went to a Christian college and and was even headed into the ministry. I went to college with the intention of going to seminary and then made a right turn and went into broadcasting. Hmm. So 
at 47, I found myself divorced for the second time. And good Baptist boys from Tulsa don't get divorced once. <laughs> Let alone twice, I, right? Yeah. Here I've found myself divorced twice. And the second time was uh, I, I had been married to a physician. And for the seven years of that marriage, I had basically was helping her build her business, which I was not an owner of. Right. And uh, I found myself basically kind of thrown out on the curb and had to kind of like put life back together and start over. Right. And the way that I responded to that was after all these years of following my faith and then seeing that faith not produce an answer to prayers <laughs> that to keep that marriage together. Right. I shook my fist to the sky and I basically wiped everything clean that I believed. I was like, if, if that belief system can't produce a better result than that, then I've got to figure out what can. <laughs> yeah. Get to the root of it. Right. Right. And, and that sent me on a course of, I, I spent basically the first year after that, just, uh, really in rebellion. And then I figured I got to pull this together. And, uh, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought this, uh, this fifth wheel RV. <laughs> <laughs> now I was in Texas at the time and I thought I would travel around at least in, you know, in, around Texas and some of the surrounding areas. And, and yeah, I was, I was grasping for, I was trying to lock onto something. Uh, what year is this? 2009 was okay. when I got the RV. So gotcha. two th late 2007 was the divorce. 2008 was just mad. And then 2009 was, the best year of my life because what happened is I ended up getting a job that was, that kept me mostly in Dallas, but I pulled out to the East side of town and got into a park out there. That's actually some friends of mine from my television days owned. And they, it had a beautiful little pond on it and out in the woods. And I sat out there and recreated my life basically mm. over the course of 2009 and that was when I found the material that changed my life. So I found Bob Proctor and Bob Proctor had a story that he told about Warren Von Braun, who was one of the early engineers in the NASA program saying that with the physical laws of the universe, we can launch a rocket, land it on the moon, bring it back, land it in a precise, precise spot on the earth, all through physics, through mathematics. Right. And he said, if, if the physical laws of the universe are so precise, should not the spiritual laws of the universe be as precise? Right. But yes, that's what I'm looking for. Right. So I started down that journey. On that journey, I, I started reading some material about parallel universes of self or, or parallel universes, parallel realities, inf infinite realities. And I found this book by a guy by the name of Fred Dodson called Parallel Universes of Self. And I started mm -hmm. reading that. And that opened me up to a whole new world that I had not been exposed to. Mm, mm. I went to a program called Landmark Education. That gave me another tool in the toolbox of living a different life, living a life that is created from within. Right. And ironically, uh, a couple of years later, I had a total intuitive prompt. And this is what I'm talking about right. of, of how do we allow our, how do we allow our internal connection with divine source yes to to guide us uh, you were asking about that a minute ago and I, yes. I woke up this morning and there was an article in on my little thing that i read through and it said here are four lies of the new age movement mm. <laughs> well mm. obviously that caught my attention and one of the four was basically like you were saying obliterate the ego no, that's not what we do. We, right. The ego is what makes me, me, and you, you. It's, right. it's what we do to to be us. It's how we, I think, the, where I've come to the conclusion, it's how we take the actions that intuition tells us to take. Right. So if you frame it up that way, then yes, I mean, the ego is very involved. You yes. don't stuff the ego in a sack and throw it off the bridge. That's right. So... Living this intuitive life 
I was getting ready to go on a bicycle ride one day and I got this, I was filling up my water bottles at the sink and I got this intuitive voice that just said, email Fred Dodson about doing his audio books. Nice. I'd been reading some audio books for uh, Audible and I literally set the water bottles down and I went over to the computer and I found his email address. And this was a guy that I only read like two of his books. I really didn't know who he was. Right. But it just, it, I mean, it was a clear prompt. So my ego walked over and, and typed up the email. <laughs> and basically by the next morning around nine o'clock, he and I had exchanged three or four emails and we were off and running on book number one. Awesome. And I am now working on book number 14. And so most mornings I get up and for several hours, I go into a studio that I have in my home here and I uh, record audiobooks, And that has that's been a big part of what has also completely shifted my reality because absorbing into that material every day for right. almost five right. has been beyond the best therapy and I get paid for it. <laughs> I know. So this is, this is fascinating to me on a lot of different levels and we'll definitely get deeper into your story too. So the idea of hitting this point where you just knew things weren't working and you just kind of stripped down your whole belief system to the ground, right? And you're like, I'm going to build this up and actually want, I want to create the life I want to leave or live, not leave. <laughs> I'm going to leave the life that I the didn't want. One. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so you did that and you built it up and you found all of these tools and I would love to investigate some of the specificities of those maybe a little bit later, but you, you build them back up and then you start getting these prompts, right? And these prompts are something that truthfully, whether anyone listening thinks they don't get them, you get them. You 100%, oh, they're there. They're there. Mm. Sometimes you have to peel away certain behaviors or habits or actions or kind of patterns that you may have running without your knowledge to get to them, but they're there. And what's funny is, is you did a very similar thing that I did to kind of launch my career that I still find myself in. I got a prompt to reach out to a few different people. It, they got back to me. It started a blossoming relationship. And then lo and behold, I was doing what I wanted to be doing. Um, so that to me is interesting. The other really interesting thing about this, since we're on a podcast, it's an audio medium, at least this one and yours, um, this idea of using your voice. Um, voice is a really, 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 really interesting thing. There's a great book, I've referenced it a million times on this podcast, um, The Mysticism of Sound and Music by Hazrat Inayat Khan, who is a Sufi mystic. And there's a wonderful part about voice and how, why is it that we can hear um, someone's voice and they're both in tune and they're both on key, but one just penetrates so much deeper. And what he talks about is this inner authenticity and this inner connection to the deepest layer of yourself and this higher self. And when you can get in tune with that, your voice carries this additional energy with it that people respond to. And this can also be found not just through a vocal voice, but through a writing voice, through anything, through art. Um, so it's really cool to me that you, you know, you just to be clear, I mean, everyone can hear it. You have a great voice. So it's not like a huge surprise that you'd be doing audiobooks. But I think it's cool that kind of synthesized in with your manifesting this life you wanted to leave, live. I keep saying leave. <laughs> so what, what? What was kind of what were that's one kind of signpost and beacon on what was going on with you. But like, what were some things you were picking up along the way? Because I imagine your life before kind of this period of realizing you didn't want to be doing this and everything was kind of falling apart. What were kind of some of the key differences between your life before all of this started happening and then after? I think it's one of the key things that most people battle every day. And it was the, it's the key to what you were saying. How do we open up that in that internal voice is because I was driven completely by every external force around me. Right. I was driven by all the expectations of others. I was driven by the shoulds. I was driven by the musts. I was driven by uh, how I looked in the church community hmm. to the family. I wasn't myself. And I think what happens, I've been coaching my podcast listeners around this. And one of the things that I've been doing, if you just take your, um, let's say, take your left hand and just hold it uh, like an umbrella over your, like, over your stomach area. Let's say that's your conscious mind. 
it's the dominant. And then take your right hand and just way down underneath that, kind of just wiggle it, wiggle your fingers down there. That's your, that's your silent, internal, intuitive voice. I like to connect it to the subconscious, but I think there is this part of us that is connected to the energy that we, that we know as God. I like the way that, uh, again, Bob Proctor's teaching from the Science of Getting Rich book that was written back in 1910, hmm. where Wallace Waddle said that there is this thinking substance that permeates, penetrates, and fills all the spaces of the universe. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's a thinking substance. Fred was, Fred, I read a section of the book that I'm working on with Fred right now, uh, just yesterday. This beautiful section that he was, he was saying that consciousness, this is some heavy stuff now. You ready for some heavy I'm stuff? I'll give so you a little ready. bit of heavy stuff. Then we got to tell a joke. So get a joke ready. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> so like he's saying, who are you? Who is Noah? Is Noah your body? Is it your mind? Is it your thoughts? You know, it's none of that. It's the consciousness that is you. In essence, your soul. And then Fred was saying, is there a consciousness that can look at and observe consciousness itself? Hmm. And he said, I believe there is. Right. That there is this super consciousness or hyper consciousness. Some call it God. Right. And then he gave a long list of other names that we call this being. So all the different races and nationalities around the world have a different expression of this hyper consciousness. Unfortunately, the faith that I grew up in <laughs> turned it turned it into this angry God sitting on a cloud somewhere with a scoreboard and an abacus in his hand saying, whoops, sorry, that was the last one you get. Right, right, you know, right. off to hell you go. Yeah. And that's that's not it at all. And it's what you said. It's it's absolute, eternal, unconditional love. Yeah, it is. And it's 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 such a weird thing to talk about unconditional love, because for most of my life up until I was about 22 and had a big experience that I've referenced many times, if someone would have said unconditional love, I would have done one of two things. It would have been like, yeah, 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 of course, I get it. Not really getting it, but just saying, oh, yeah, I understand the concept. Or two would have been like, oh, God, I don't, come on, really? Like, it's so mushy. I don't really need to hear about that. Come on, please. You know, you hippie. But then I had a direct experience with it, and that forever has changed my life, and quite frankly, at the time, had really very limited tools and ability to process what was happening. And all I could talk about after the experience was this idea of unconditional love and really, you know, probably was two steps away from being like a raving lunatic on the street, just screaming about unconditional love. I was doing it to my friends and family and they tolerate it. Uh, but, you know, that's really what had happened. But the truth of the matter is, is that is, I believe, the source and the ground for everything that we experience. Now, this gets a little bit weird if we start looking at this 3D world that we're in uh, more like a dream than as like an actual place where we are. So if we look at it more like through the gaze of when we go to sleep and we dream and we wake up, we go, oh, that was just a dream. That wasn't that real. You know, that was just us doing that thing we do. I personally, through direct experience and, you know, cross-referencing and learning and meeting and talking and discussing, I think that's what this is. I think that's what this world is. And that doesn't mean we strip away the responsibility and the actions of what we need to do. It's just that's kind of how this world works. But that opens up a tremendous amount of potential and opportunity for us. And it also begs the question of why? Why would we be in this place like this? What is the function of this reality? Is there a why? Um, and I think there's a lot of answers to those potentially. But every ultimately, that's an individual uh, kind of uh, remembrance or knowingness that comes about. And when you're talking about this consciousness that can reflect back on itself, I think I subscribe to the theory that we are that consciousness. We are the same exact thing as this omnipotent source that we can tap into. We happen to have made the decision, I believe consciously, to incarnate into physical bodies, which give us some restrictions in terms of what we can do. You know, we can't just 
instantly teleport where we want to or instantly conjure up scenes amongst us, but we do have the potential to do that stretched over this dimension we call time. So if you want to do something and you have the intention to do it, you can put the wheels in motion to actually achieve that. So I think we're that's that's kind of what we're talking about here. I guess what what are your views since I brought it up uh or did I bring it up? What do you think of this world as being kind of a dream or another way of looking at it, maybe a training ground where we learn certain things like do you believe in reincarnation? I, I knew you grew up a uh, fundamentalist Christian, but what are your views on kind of reincarnation, how we fit into all of this? Hi, Noah. The first and only episode I partly listened to was Paul Austin, Johnny Appleseed, and Mike Reducey. I'm going to be honest with you and say that as you kept quote unquote taking over monopolizing the conversations, dot, 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 not letting your guest do his thing, dot, 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 I became more frustrated, dot, 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 finally stopped listening. I felt you were, slash, are in love with the sound of your own voice, slash, conclusions, dot, 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 even drifting away from the subject of microdosing, dot, 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 almost out of control. There are those who know how to skillfully interview to balance his own opinions with humility and wisely giving most of the time to his guest, dot, 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 without having to show the world how much he thinks he knows. I may go back and finishing listening to your, you and Paul Austin, dot, 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 though not really looking forward to your verbal oral narcissisms. I see you interview many interesting folks. Maybe I should give you another chance. And on the other hand, dot, 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 maybe you care not a thing about my opinion. Milana. That's a little piece of feedback I got in an email about this podcast. If you want to counter that, make me feel a little bit good about what I'm doing, go leave a review on iTunes. There are many ways to do that. Uh, I really appreciate it. And to Milana, mahalo. I hope you're doing well. Bye-bye. Can I go back and just and I, I'd love to finish that little example. And I took notes, so I'm yes. going to come back and hit yeah. two points. Here, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that little thing where you've got your left hand up and then your, your oh, right yeah. hand, you're kind of just like dangling your fingers down there going, na, 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 na. That's, that to me is like the dominance of the conscious mind, the dominance of the ego mm. and the intuitive voice trying to get through, but it whispers, it's not loud, it's soft. And it, and what usually happens is the ego will give four, five, six reasons of why whatever the intuitive voice is saying is not right. That's no, right. of course you don't need it. And it will analyze and literally squelch that little voice. That's right. Now, what I realized is the conscious or that ego mind only can experience and express itself out of what has already happened. Mm. It has no pretense of the future whatsoever. Mm. But because that intuitive voice is connected to that hyper-consciousness, to that thinking substance, then it knows that's the voice that tells a wife to call her husband and tell him not to get on TWA flight 800. Right. Right. That's the voice that tells you, no, don't go down that alley at night, et cetera. So what I've been trying to do is literally shift. So move your hands now and bring your right hand up over your left hand so that the still small voice becomes the dominant voice. And what I do, I, I go on hikes up here in the mountains. And when I get on a hiking trail, I will ask my conscious mind, are you willing, are you just willing for, and I'll pick a point, like up until that pine tree up there, are you willing to just be subservient and let the subconscious speak? Mm. And now I get complete agreement. At first it was an argument. <laughs> and... So I've really worked over the last year and a half since I've been here in Aspen, particularly on allowing that, that, um, still small voice to be the dominant voice directionally. Right. Where are we headed? What are we going to do? Should I turn to the right? Should I turn to the left? What's best for my soul? What should I be working on financially? What should I be working on relationship wise? 
it's a, it's an amazing power. And that's why I started coaching um, through the podcast on it because I just wanted to give that gift to other people. Right. So that's that. Now let's go to your point about earth school and reincarnation. I had a coach who said earth would call this the earth school. And I love that. Right. Um, because I really do now, now it makes so much more sense that yes, we are an eternal soul that is on a path that we don't just do this the first time. And now there is, or just one time, right. as as I was taught, you know, basically in the Christian faith, um, you're born, you have a chance to accept Christ or not, you die, and then you're judged based on that one decision. Right. Well, <laughs> thank goodness that there's there are different ways of looking at things because there are just a lot of holes that you can create with that. But... Um, I think that we are a soul, that we're on a path, that we have multiple times. I've been uh, diagnosed as an old soul. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and so I I'm, I've, have been around this lap a few times before. And I think when you say why this reality, because I think I, I really like the idea that as a soul, before we incarnate into this existence, that we do specify intentions of what we are given the choice to learn Agreed. in this life. Agreed. And and with that, I think I, I agree, the soul partners. I was walking into a Unity Church in Dallas in 2012, in the fall of, two th no, in, in the summer of 2013 mm. it was. And this lady walked by me and we were both a few minutes late to the meeting and she walked by me and opened the door real fast and walked in. And I just was like, what in the world was, it was a burst of energy that I'd never seen or felt before. Mm. And we ended up dating until I uh, moved up here to Colorado and realized that we had several past lives together. Right. Um, I wasn't exposed to that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> it also helps explain, uh, it helps explain if you, and boy, you really have to let go on this one. Yeah. Gosh, here's where the ego mind comes in. Right. This will challenge some of, some of you will, this might not land really well. <laughs> just warning, 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 but you have to, you just have to let go and you have to experience and experiment with this and try it on right. for yourself and see if it works for you. But when bad things happen. Yeah. And you just release the analysis that the mind and the ego wants to attribute to that. Oh, that was bad. Yep. You know where I'm going. Because that soul chose that bad to happen so that they could grow. And I'll tell you, the evidence of that is my own situation. When I look back and I see my, my parents, how my mom influenced me, my main trouble was on my mother's side, my dad was an angel incarnate. I swear to God, he was yeah. just amazing. Yeah. And my mom produced the, the challenges and two divorces and hitting bottom and all of that combined. I wouldn't trade it for anything yeah, to be where I am today because the soul growth through that has been unbelievable. Yes. yes. So I think when you, when you, when you, so you release the ego you allow a much greater thing to have occurred, and that is that an infinite soul, before it came to this earth school, chose what it wanted to work on. Right. And a, a path was designed for that soul to follow. And then, as humans, we're given choice. And this is why, you know, so many people, I've talked to so many people who, especially in, like I'm single, so in the dating situation, <laughs> people will say, Oh God, my ex, he just never got it. You know, mm. when people don't get it, it's because we have choice. Yeah. We're given a choice. Yeah. Fred talks about the river of life, the stream of life. So think of floating down a river in a boat. And if you're in the stream, that's the path. How do we know that we're in the river? From that still small voice. And if we're in the path, the river of life will take us where we're supposed to go. Now, we have a paddle in our hands, 
And we can use that paddle to either gently bump off of the rocks and stay in the path, or we can turn the boat around and we can paddle real fast and we can go back upstream because we, you know, we got, oh, we got to get back up there and I'm not going to go down. This isn't the wrong way. And, oh, if I get over here to the side, maybe there's a better river over there on the other side of those trees. And come on, paddle, to paddle, paddle, paddle to the side. <laughs> and we're just like living this frantic resistance, this constant resistance to the flow that life is trying to take us down. Hmm. But we're paddling upstream and we're paddling sideways and we're trying to pull the boat out of the water. And it's like, that's what I was doing for almost 50 years. I was, I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. Well, this lifetime. And I mean, just to latch onto that analogy, it's merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. You're supposed to not take this. This is where all our trouble stems from. I mean, I can tell you having this, this last year has been, has been both the highest of highs with the birth of my son and professionally some of the lowest of lows. Um, but when you can kind of take this idea of levity or lightness and non-resistance, doesn't mean giving up, but letting this stream carry you down these pre-designed experiences. And I totally agree with you without getting attached to them, without getting hooked up on a rock, you know, and you can't get away from it and it might turn over. That's the kind of alchemy and magic that we're looking for. And and the hard part is, like you're saying, a lot of people might have trouble with this, is when bad shit happens to you or other people, being able to recognize that that is a function of something. It's not uh, an example of an uncaring, unfeeling, unloving, uncompassionate universe. In fact, it's creating conditions to potentially awake the opposite of those qualities. So I love that you you use this analogy of the stream of life and, and allowing yourself to kind of fit into the flow of it. And the other thing you're pointing out, which is, I mean, just so people don't think this is magical or idealistic thinking is once you latch on to your intuition, it doesn't mean that everything is smooth. I mean, in fact, just the opposite can be true quite a bit. Your intuition will guide you into experiences that are fraught with uh, consternation, difficulty, suffering, because those are specifically the transformational points and nexuses where you can have this growth to kind of get to a place where even if bad shit happens to you, which it will, you have an ability to process it in a way that is helpful and healthy for yourself and other people. So I love that that analogy, man. That's That's super awesome. So you say you're a late bloomer, but... Um, it doesn't really matter now, does it? I mean, now you're living this life in a place you love to be in, doing a thing you love to be doing. Um, you know, I, I think that's the coolest thing that anyone can have. You know, that's that's it. You're living the life you want to live. That's super fucking cool, man. And, you know, one of the things that's funny, back to full circle of what we started talking about <laughs> yeah. is in, in my astrological chart, which I think the, the astrology chart holds the roadmap yes. of what we've chosen for this incarnation that it says that it, things will get better in the later years. Mm. So I'm, I'll be turning 58 later this year. So really things shifted dramatically for me seven years ago. So, you know, mm -hmm. in early fifties, yeah, I mean, it was, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, and now I am, there's a book that I narrated for Fred called levels of energy, yeah. which is kind of a, similar book, a cousin book to Dr. David Hawkins book, power versus force. Yeah. You know, just, it, I don't want to cut you off, but I just saw something you posted on an episode of a podcast in this guy. And I started watching some YouTube videos of him. Can you just finish your thought and then tell me a little bit about him specifically? Cause I was oh, pretty, yeah, no, I can yeah. tell you about Dr. Hawkins. He was a psychologist in New York. He, um, uh, had his practice in a hospital and then a clinic on long Island primarily and had a, an, an, incredible distinguished career and then he moved to Sedona in his later years where mostly he taught the concepts that he put in practice in his practice mm. ironically last uh, two ski seasons ago so the first year I was here the ski season see you measure everything up here in ski season <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's pretty awesome that's how, you, that's how you clock your life the calendar goes out the window it's like <laughs> okay wait a minute yeah, that's two ski seasons ago. I, uh, I met a lady. I rode up the chair with um, a couple of gals that um, were from New York. And one of them was from a prominent family there. And they owned some land that was right next to Dr. Hawkins. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was they. one of their family members owned Dr. Hawkins' house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when he sold and left for Arizona, 
uh, this family bought the place. So they had a lot of connections with him and followed his work closely mm -hmm. as well. So I just felt really connected to him then. Very deep teacher on consciousness. Yeah. So he wrote in the 90s this book called Power Versus Force, where he basically puts all of the scale of human emotions from zero to a thousand. And the, the numbers are arbitrary. And Fred wrote Levels of Energy about 10 years later and did a completely different treatment to it. Mm. I think both are excellent reads and gives you a different angle, if you will, on the same topic. Mm. Mm. And this book, Noah, changed my life more than anything else. Literally shifted, altered everything. I love those books. Those are my favorite books. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> when you understand the human emotions, anger, grief, sorrow, anxiety, depression, fear, anger, narcissism, um, and then we, th those are all the lowest levels of energy. Mm. And as I was reading through this Levels of Energy by Fred, I realized how I had grown up in a complete culture of fear, which he puts as level 100 on this scale of zero to a thousand. Sure. Where basically the human emotions are experienced between zero and 600, leaving some room up there for the higher realms of energy that we don't get to touch. <laughs> and then, as he says, the only uh, being that has experienced 1000 level energy is Christ. And you could say Jesus or Christ consciousness. Sure, sure, sure. Which I have, I will say experienced at various points of my life. And it's pretty fucking amazing. <laughs> 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 Gotta say, there you go. Just saying, right? <laughs> hey, I live in Colorado. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky mountain high, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I realized how I had just been surrounded in my formative years by fear and how that had carried through. And then you learn how to walk up to the higher levels, which is pure creativity, unconditional right. love, right. peace, bliss. You get into those realms and how you can walk yourself up the scale, not only identifying where you are, but knowing how to walk up the scale. And then through kinesiology or muscle testing, you can basically kind of figure out where, what level you are and the level of energy of things around you. So mm. what really shifted for me then is I got a hypersensitivity to the energy levels that I was experiencing around me. Yeah. And that's anything from yep. a, driving into a town and feeling the energy of that town. Yeah. Walking into a meeting and feeling the energy of that meeting, going to a restaurant and determining if this was a place I wanted to stay or not. I've walked out of more restaurants yeah. since I created that book, you know, but I mean, it just really changes your perception of everything around you. Yeah, that's uh, so you didn't in your younger years have that sensitivity to energy that it, it just wasn't on your awareness spectrum or you just kind of maybe drowned it out. What, what would you say? So I spent that year in 2009 in the RV just completely dissecting my life. I filled up, I don't know how many journals, probably a, a box full wow. that's in my storage unit right now because <laughs> I don't, all my stuff is still in Texas. And while I, I, I only brought the camping gear and the ski gear that's hey, all, man, and, the, and the fishing stuff. Yeah. I know, it's all you need. <laughs> and what else? And a laptop, I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> so as I diagnosed that and literally picked my life apart all the way back, I could see that the intuition was there. Mm -hmm. And as we said earlier, it's a switch that is always on. That's you right. just have to find it, tap into it. Most people don't. That's right. But I've had those clear, I definitely had those clear experiences. I did not have a clue about energy. Yeah. Like just not even a clue. So this is where awareness comes in. Once you educate yourself on that, I would seriously, I would, if people like to listen to audiobooks, I'd be honored if you would pick it up. It's on Audible. If not, um, pick the book up or pick up Power Versus Force. Whichever you're led to, pick that one up. But um, yeah, and I'll have but, links to, to each of those too because I think this is this is fascinating stuff. To be honest, this is really giving us some type of tool or blueprint to get to these things that can be a little murky and tricky for a lot of us too. So well, and that process begins with awareness. So when you make yourself aware of these concepts and you literally immerse yourself into a book for almost 12 hours, you're going to get a lot of 
that material rubbing off on you. That's right. That's right. That's the other thing you mentioned when you had the privilege of reading these auto, audible books for people. Like it seeps in. When I was working with the clients I was working with, I mean, you were inundated with this stuff. So even if consciously you're not picking it up, it is getting in there one way or the other. I love this energy stuff you're talking about too, because I think from a very, very early age, I was acutely aware of how sensitive I am to energies around me, including thoughts and you know emotions, all of these things, um, to the point where I, at various points in my life, I, it was incredibly uncomfortable, you know, especially imagine being that sensitive and getting thrust into a, a music college of all places where it's just like the most chaotic of energies consolidated Ooh. into the most chaotic of young energy city, Boston. It was nuts. I totally get it. Um, the beauty of it is, is like you're saying, when you kind of get that entry point or whether it's a book or a psychic download, which I know sounds insane, but is something that people happens to people, um, whether it's a friend, whether it's a video, whether it's a class, whether it's a podcast, whatever it is, there's always an ability to kind of establish a baseline awareness of it like you're talking about and then figure out what works for you. Like you you might not get the exact, you know, Noah Lampert blueprint in a book or this, but eventually you learn about these ideas and concepts and kind of fundamentals of how the universe is structured. And then you get to build your own plan and use these ideas and use these perspectives to, to serve ultimately what you want to be doing. And we could debate probably not that long about it, but really is I think we're here because we are here to be serving other people, ourselves included. That's That seems to be the reason that we're here, at least in my estimation. I grew up in a world where I was taught, this is it, black and white, take it or leave it, die or go to hell. <laughs> now, I, you know, some people connect with this energy, this gift, like you said, at a very early age. Some find it in their teenage years. My journey is not your journey. Right. And I'm real careful in my podcast to say, try it on. This is what has been working for me lately. Um, always subject to revision and change as we grow and as we right. become more aware. But my path is not your path and your path is not mine. And we're in this beautiful tapestry together where in an in a infinite reality, there are no absolutes. So what works for one may not work for another. And I think the, the beauty of this is being able to tie into the whole realm of these possibilities, right. energies, r multiple realities, if you will that we can walk even different paths simultaneously. Wow, how cool is that? Um, that's the beauty of really opening up to the dimensions that are around us. Yeah, I couldn't agree. So well said, man. I, I want to I wanna get to the three questions at the end, but I, I want to get to your podcast a little bit too because we've kind of been talking about it. But not, I mean, subconscious mind mastery. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got started with this, what your intention behind it is, and... You know, just just the general idea behind it. It was the spring of 2013. My mom had just passed and it was around Easter and Easter was a special time in our family. And mom had just left us recently. Kind of interesting how this might fit together. You know, I honestly had never connected those two until this just this minute. Funny how that so, happens on the synchronicity podcast. Yes. <laughs> That's why it's here. Okay. I got to take a breath here for a second. <laughs> yeah. I got this intuitive prompt to do a podcast. Mm -hmm. Now I had the, I had all the gear. I had the radio and television production background. So I knew I could you know, produce the quality product, had no idea what I was going to talk about. <laughs> so I and the other piece that I didn't have was how you wired it together to a website and onto iTunes. Right. So I had to learn that piece. But I got the thing launched on Easter Sunday, tied all of that together, and there was the first podcast. And I, because I had no idea what I was going to do it on, I just had this prompt. I started telling my story. Right. And, you know, I have not yet gone back and listened to my first podcast. <laughs> I'm scared to. <laughs> Me neither, if I'm being honest. Since I edited it, I haven't heard mine either. <laughs> and my second podcast, okay, I've never told anybody this. I get emails periodically. Why is there no podcast number two? Hmm. 
it's because I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, oh, man, this is so cool. When I got the first podcast up there and it finally popped onto iTunes several hours later, yeah. I thought, man, this is the coolest thing in the world. And <laughs> so my second podcast, <laughs> I was so excited about it. I had the hiccups. Yeah. And I, um, <laughs> I got online and figured this, I found this thing of how to cure the hiccups by basically doing a cat cow yoga move. <laughs> And I made that the second podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, no, that's not such a good thing. That doesn't fit. You that's know, after, after all these down the line, I thought, no, I got to take that off. So <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny, man. You're like, yeah, but this is a good number two. Here you go. <laughs> it literally, and this is the beauty of following intuition because now a hundred and almost 15 podcasts later and a, a sizable audience all over the world yeah. and and it's really it's shifting what i'm working on right now and to think that that came from a little hunch that just said do a podcast yeah yeah that's it's just it's funny how these things work and following those even if you hear the voice being able to follow it and taking it you know seriously and trusting it that's the other component there and i'm i'm super happy you did because now we're connecting and you know, oh, let me tell you a story yeah, on yes. that, that I love to tell. I was, it, I had just gotten up here and I had all this Flatlander ski equipment, you know, and yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was on the chair this one Sunday and I didn't have the right gear. I didn't have the right stuff. I wasn't equipped. I didn't have a system or anything, but I yeah. was skiing and riding up the chair. I thought I had my phone in my coat pocket. And I was going to get it to do whatever. Um, so I pulled my glove off and stuck my glove down and reached in to get my phone. And I mean, I heard this almost audible. It was loud. It said, don't. Mm. Now, at this point, ego mind was still arguing with intuitive mind. <laughs> right. Oh, you got to be kidding. I'm fine. Yeah, just I'll just hold on to it tight. Don't worry about it. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. Reached in, grabbed the phone. Did whatever. I took a picture, got on Facebook. I don't know what I did. No, I didn't drop the phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I put the phone back in the pocket and I went looking for the glove. Mm -hmm. And the glove was nowhere to be found. <laughs> <laughs> and as I start, I was in the chair by myself. And I'm sure the guys behind me were laughing at me because they could see me look over to the left, look over to the right, raise my arm, look under my crotch. You know, right, right. And then finally turned around and looked behind me and they're going, it's down by tower 12. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And now here's the problem. Aspen mountain is a pretty steep ski mountain. And I was not ready for <laughs> the steeper parts of Aspen mountain. I would just gotten here. I was right. still getting, you know, and I hadn't figured this out yet. So my glove was down on a part where I had to crawl my way in there, basically wow. get my glove and crawl my way back out and that was a very good, gentle <laughs> yeah, yeah. universe that really set the stage of what I've been doing and working on up here. All I had to do was just ski down some steep stuff that I wasn't really ready for and wiggle in there and pick up my glove and then wiggle back out. Could have been a lot worse. And that was the universe saying, see, if you will follow this, then you won't have those kinds of problems. Yeah. And, and you got a literal look, you have to go down a steep, dangerous place in real world. So take this as a lesson that you don't want to metaphorically go through this when you don't pay attention. So <laughs> you got to. You know, what's crazy is that even after that, even after that, I kept arguing of course, with it. That's that's so that, yeah. finally I got to the point where I've made that shift and the right hand is up over the left hand and the intuitive voice now when that shows up, and I, I also, and this is part of what I'm doing with the coaching, is teaching people this little muscle testing technique of how you can tune into that voice mm. all the time, 24-7, 365. Mm. It's always there. You can tune into it. It will be there for you. And that's part of the technique that I've been walking people through because it does take some coaching. I mean, I, I, I haven't course. talked about it. Because it's something that you really have to walk people through a process for themselves. And... Now, when that voice shows up, it is 100%, no questions asked, that's what I do. That's Just awesome. go there. Just wow. blindly go there. Trust it. Faith, 
Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Let's get to these three questions. Uh, and then I have my, my question at the end. So what's your favorite color? Blue. What's your favorite number? Seven. What's your favorite animal? Bear. Cool. Uh, and last question. What's a practical tip that has helped you in your life that you could share with people listening? The theme of what we've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest shift in my life has been saying yes to intuition every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. What what really needs to be said? I mean, I, what a fun episode, man. Really, this has been great. I'm super happy uh, that Brandon, my friend Brandon Park, your friend Brandon Park introduced us. Um, just a real thrill. Um, we'll be in touch super soon, but thank you so much for doing this. You are a rock star, my friend. I have really <laughs> enjoyed getting to know you as well. I know you're about to embark on vacation. I hope it's great. Thank you for this. It has been an amazing connection, energy, and conversation. <laughs> awesome, man. We'll be in touch real soon. Thanks, Noah. All right, buddy. Thanks for listening to that episode with Thomas. Really cool dude. Check out his podcast, Subconscious Mind Mastery. Maybe stay tuned for it on MindPod Network too. Who knows? Who knows? A reminder, this event, September 21st, New York City. Gonna get ready to release all of the names of the people involved with that. If you're on the East Coast, if you can make it September 21st, 6 to 10 p.m., uh, I'll announce the venue soon. Uh, we're having a live MindPod Network event. It's going to be really fucking cool. Very excited about it. Um, so stay tuned for that. If you can make it, I would love to see you and meet you. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for listening past the music. You're great. A reminder, if you can, chip in, support the show, crowd sponsor it, Patreon, donation on, any way you want, man. Dude, that was pretty corny. See, see what I'm resorting to? I'm having to resort to weird rhyming schemes to get my point across about supporting the show. Regardless, even if you don't support financially, I really appreciate you listening to it. And I will see you next week with Dr. Eben Alexander. Bye-bye.